Hello and welcome to another episode of the 905er podcast. My name is Roland Tanner. I am Joel McLeod. And in the roundup this week, we've got a uh, couple of stories of a kind of provincial um, angle, I guess. Um, starting off with with Doug Ford's recent comments to uh, the mayor of Mississauga, Bonnie Crombie, um, telling her to stop whining. And um, well, uh, a few people have had some thoughts about this, and and and, and you're one of them, uh, Joel. Yeah. Well. Uh, um, yeah. So there's a clip kind of passing around on social media of on from uh, City News, CP24, of uh, of Doug Ford basically trying to take Bonnie Crombie for ta- to, to task for her criticisms of Bill 23, basically stating that you know the city of Mississauga, uh, for one, could stand to lose you know. Millions of dollars in development fees over the long haul, which are going to this is going to impact their operating budget and possibly cause the increase of property taxes uh, and whatever have you. Um, that's a debate for another day, whether that's good or bad or, or whatever have you. But Doug Ford's comments uh, to the press was, be, you know, telling Bonnie Crombie uh, to quit complaining, quit uh, quit her whining, uh, and stop being disingenuous. Uh, in her comments to the public, um, it was interesting to say the least. Uh, what caught my, you know, whenever you hear a, a a male politician going off on a female politician about, you know, about that, it was, uh, you know, kind of, I mean, it, it kind of perks my ears and what's going on there. But what really kind of connected the dots, and it wasn't even me, it was, um, and D- Roland, you got to help me out here, but Sid, Sid Sixero. <laughs> Sid Sixero. Thank you. Sid, I'm sorry if you're listening to this. My apologies. Um, but I saw a clip of him on the, you know, he's co-host of uh, Breakfast Television. Saw a clip of him. And he's, he was pointing out that Doug Ford seems to have a habit uh, uh, you know, kind of doubling down in this language whenever it comes to a woman criticizing him. Uh, uh, you know, you know, if you flash back, uh, I think a week before, uh, the Auditor General Bonnie uh, Bonnie Lissick um, uh, came came with her report, basically criticizing. You know, what did the, uh, the provincial government do with all that COVID money? Uh, there's also criticisms of the way that the prov- province's uh, casinos are operating. That you know, there's there's questionable logistics happening there in terms of preventing money laundering uh, from going on there. And so she, in her report, she put this out there. And of course, what is Doug Ford's response? Stay in your lane. It it, 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 it it startles me. You know, the auditor general, Bonnie Lissick was like their best pal when it came to the auditor general's office, criticizing the previous liberal government's handling of gas plants uh, of, of, their, their policies, when it came down to going through them with a fine tooth comb as the auditor general should and finding, you know, these things don't add up, things aren't quite working out, you know, whatever have you, you know, all of a sudden, like they're, you know, oh, they're doing stand up work. You know, they're, they're, they're doing, they're, they're doing the right thing, shining the light on, on government corruption, government mismanagement. We, you know, we need them to, to keep, uh, keep those damn liberals honest. And now when she does the same thing to this progressive conservative government, it's basically stay in your lane, shut up, do your job. And I'm sorry, but like, you know, what, 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 what workplace would we sit there and say to uh, a, a CEO or president of a corporation saying to a female employee, female su- subordinate, saying that to them and we say, well, you know, that's just, you know, you know, she, re- she really should stay in her, her lane. She really should stop complaining and really should stop with the, you know, you know, w- with the, the rhetoric and, and, and whatnot. Like where, where would we say that that is an acceptable uh, uh, phrase or, or acceptable behavior from a president or CEO of a private corporation, private company uh, in this day and age? Yeah, that's the reason. That's a reason. Yeah, it's a reasonable question. Um, is that there's behavior in in politics that that is 
we still are in the habit of accepting certain behavior from politicians that would not be accepted in any other walk of life. It would be considered completely unprofessional and grounds for all kinds of complaints. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, is, is Ford being sexist? My gut says, yeah. Um, might he use these same words against a man? Uh, my gut also says, well, yeah, I wouldn't put it past him. I mean, and is, is to an extent, is that, any more forgivable these are still unprofessional um and kind of ridiculous ways to behave i mean well, then again i've said some pretty unprofessional things about doug ford um i mean to extent the 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 the, the language used against bonnie lissack who is a public servant uh, and who doesn't have the ability to to fight back basically you know i was I, i'm always aware of the difficult position that that um the employees of of government uh, or the legislature or whoever are in and that they are they and sometimes I feel they they are not answerable enough but but in many ways you know a politician can stand up and throw any amount of mud at them and they cannot throw mud back Bonnie Crombie at least you know she's been around for for a while she she can look after herself you know um, and she can she can fight back in in using the usual political stuff um so but yeah, it, it it is. It's it's a bit of a habit, isn't it? I mean, it, like, like you said, uh, Sid Six Zero said said that, and then there's um, uh, there's uh, was another example of a uh, well, again, I mean, kind of um, uh, the fact that QP, the recent uh, dispute with QP, uh, QP in some ways the leadership is is is, and I'm using the, the words of Kelly Elliott here from from. Uh, uh, from Twitter, uh, the, Q, the sort of leadership of QP is female dominated, her words. Um, right. And that also, you know, kind of like uh, a certain amount of kind of paternalistic, you know, don't make me angry or you won't like it when I'm angry kind of kind of talk coming from uh, Ford. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it, yeah. Should we be surprised? No. You know, is this completely in line with what everybody thinks Doug Ford is? Yes. Um, so to an extent, well, it's like uh, you know, it's just hardly surprising. Other than that, it's not acceptable anymore. Look um, at look at what's what's going on with let's, let's look at his behavior when it comes to to our uh, the unions. You know, we know QP uh, the, the QP members who who uh, educational workers in our school systems predominantly female. It's a predominantly female profession, and you know we. I'm going to go and invoke the notwithstanding clause to get my way. It, it, it's it's astounding. Yeah, you know, there's no there's no uh, there's no pushback on male dominated dominated unions. Um, you know, the firefighters, police unions, that kind of thing. Oh, we'll find the money to to allow police to hire more more cops or more firefighters. And not just to be clear, folks. I'm not saying don't hire more cops or more firefighters. Um, or don't, you know, don't pay them more. They do a dangerous job. Uh, they, they need it, but yet there's no, there's no pushback for women who are trusted to help teach our children who are helped to keep our schools running and, and whatnot. Oh no, they're, they're asking too much. We can't give them what they want. Same as, um, our, our hospital system, nursing, nursing is a very female dominated profession. And they are, they have been asking for, you know, just respect since the start of this pandemic, you know, give us a, give them a break, give, you know, give, give them a break, give them a, a, a chance to breathe and, and pay them from, for, after being the heroes of the pandemic, give them the pay that they deserve. Nope. Can't find that. You know, they're just, you know, they're just greedy, uh, you know, greedy whatever and we can't find the money to help them out and it's like you know you start looking at this as certain trend happening here and it's like well why why does this constantly keep coming coming up whenever you know a, a woman steps to the microphone and says i want what i'm what i what i deserve you know what what i would we deserve to be paid fairly to be recognized for the hard work that we're doing um, we're, we deserve to be, to be heard when we're advocating for our constituents. 
or we deserve to be heard when we believe that mismanagement of public funds has occurred. Yeah, it, it does reek of that of the old-fashioned calm down dear approach. I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the what's his name uh, Cameron in Britain was the last prime minister to sort of say that. Just openly say it. Um, I think now it's that there's just they do it more in a coded way, you know. And, and this is kind of that code of well, you're whining. I mean, what is Bonnie Crombie saying? She's she's complaining about the the, the fact that the, that the um, cities are looking at a, a massive financial shortfall uh, combined with with um, developers just getting carte blanche um, in every regard. I mean, that's the very definition of not whining, isn't it? And why did he pick out Bonnie Crombie when every yeah. mayor in the 905 would be saying the same thing, pretty much? Well, um, we know we, we had an emo on uh, a couple couple episodes ago uh, uh, to, to discuss that they have legitimate concerns. They were not consulted on that bill. And now you're left with not just Bonnie Crombie, but numerous mayors across the, uh, the 905 and across the province who are saying, wait a minute, like, how is this supposed to work now? Like our entire finance financial system was geared around developer charges. If you want to do away with it, fine. But what, what are, what are municipalities supposed to do now? Right. And why should Bonnie Crombie get on, get on board to use his words? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah. I mean, that, that's where the, why did he pick out her? Well, apparently she's handing out leaflets or something. It's like, again, oh, geez, that's, that's politics, dude. <laughs> you know? He did the same thing when he was, uh, you know, that's what you do in your politics. You hand out leaflets, you you mobilize your base, you hold rallies, um, you know, you hold, what do you call it? Oh, Ford Fests to to drum up support and to and mo- mobilize your grassroots base. You know, this is, I, 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 I do, I, I thought Sid's, Common, you know, it was kind of an eye, eye opener. Like I, I didn't connect the dots before, him, but he kind of did it for me when I saw this clip. And I, was, I said, "Yeah, you know, he kind of does. You know, when a, when a woman steps to the microphone and says, says, excuse me, I have, I, I have some points to make here. Um, it's you know, quit your, quit your bitching, stay in your lane. You know, get on board, quit your whining, and, uh, so, and I, say, I say, that, say that to, say that to, a, to a, you know, to a." You know, he, he he dare wouldn't say that to uh, to John Tory. I'll say that much. You know, he he never said that to John Tory. Say, hey, John, quit your whining, stay in your lane, figure out your mess. Uh, you know, he he couldn't he couldn't wait to come to Toronto's defense and say, well, we'll help, we'll find you some money for this this fiscal year uh, to help your operating costs. Um, yet yeah. you know, Miss Sog comes calling and it's like, hey, 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 stay you know, stay where you are, don't get uppity. And the irony is, of course, that you know, it, with with what's just been done by the province to the municipalities, Mrs. Zargo is in a particularly difficult place because they are more behind than almost anywhere else in in hitting their targets uh, for for property. Why is that? Because Mrs. Zargo has been doing that kind of development more than anybody else for the last 50 years, and they've got no land left to build on. They can only intensify because there is no green space. Um, so they're, you know, deep in a the hole. They've, they've basically spent the family silver and already built. They, um, they li- they've literally painted themselves into a corner. Yeah. Um, so Mrs. Saga is in trouble. People are, you know, we, we talked uh, earlier in the year about how Mrs. Saga's population is unbelievably actually dropping. So Mrs. Saga is in trouble. Um, that That is the legacy of... Um, of uh, Hazel McCallion um, and all the, you know, it's it's it's, it's, it's the legacy of, of 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 provincial policy since the Second World War, um, and they're they're going to reap the whirlwind first, uh, in essence. But so, uh, but you know, what's Bonnie Crombie supposed to do? I think it's reasonable enough to say, you know. <laughs> We're being screwed here. Um, an already difficult situation is just now uh, getting worse. Um, yeah, I, and you know, Ford looks at the world through, well, basically the the, the le- through a lens of of a of a dinosaur. Uh, it is a male dominated world. Uh, who do his mm. policies? If you you want to you want to see the most macho male dominated um, uh, culture in in this country. Um, 
go to a city hall on a night when a development application is being considered and when the developers are in and they all stand at the back of the room in their dark suits and look angry as, as, the, as the councillors dare to consider whether they will approve or disapprove their building. Uh, my God, you never see a woman there. Um, uh, you know, this, everything that's been done um, uh, with the developers in mind in the last few weeks is um, uh, already raked of, of, of sexism and uh, the uh, male traditional male way of looking at the world, of using up resources and to hell with the consequences and don't let anybody stand in our way because we know what's best. Uh, so, yeah, uh, can we point at this and say this is uh, another example? Sure, but I'd say everything that Ford does already reeks of, of that kind of, uh, you, know, what I could, you know, I try to avoid phrases that everybody's using just because but male privilege um it is yeah he's 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 a dinosaur he's a male dinosaur and uh, he that's the way he why operates don't we, why don't we call it, uh, a break on that we'll come back after uh, after this okay and we're back with uh uh with more uh more to talk about um so we've gone from uh doug ford is a closet sexist <laughs> Uh, you know, definitely, definitely has a heart, a way of talking to women, uh, that politely to, you know, the end more on the Queens Park question, has the NDP shot themselves in the foot in their, in the latest leadership race? Uh, and by that, I mean, uh, Merritt Stiles, who is going to be crowned leader of the, of her majesty's loyal opposition at Queens Park. Uh, because nobody else wanted the job, basically. Um, yeah, so you know, it, it, you might not you might not have been paying attention because who was? But Merritt Stiles, who I'll be honest, was a fantastic education critic in the previous government, who really held Doug Ford and Stephen Lecce to task during the pandemic uh, for just confusing and muddled messaging in terms of what was going on in our schools. It was. She showed up most days than Andrea Horvath did, I thought. So credit to where credit's due. She did a great job as a, as a critic in, uh, in the opposition. And I wasn't surprised when she put forward her name to run for leader of the NDP. I thought, yeah, that made perfect sense. Great. Go, go for it. And that was it. Nobody else put their name forward, and she is going to be crowned or, or given the, you know, be, be made the, the leader of the opposition. Now there are two ways to say this. Uh, the NDP are in completely, they just looked at her and said, yeah, that's it. We just, we want her as leader. We are, we are so behind her as leader. There's nobody else possibly who would want to put their name forward. Or two, the NDP have really screwed themselves over here. And I'm inclined to think the latter. Now here's why. Um, leadership races are a great way to reinvigorate the party, to highlight the party, to get people to pay attention to the party, to get the people to pay attention to potential leaders and to draw attention and to really force public uh, shifts in attention to new ways of, well, how can we do things differently? The NDP through their own, um, I, I, maybe their own rules. I don't know. They, I mean, you had to put up $50,000 to even enter into the race. And then on top of that, and then you got to go fundraise to pay for the busing and the plane trips around on, uh, Ontario to get your supporters. You know, was it, was the, were the, was the task to, were the, the, the levels to owners too high for other members to come in? But I just, I look and say, you're telling me, sitting in the opposition you have a party that is potentially poised to win power next election no one in the entire party said i want to crack at that it, even just to say merit i i know you're a good you're, good, you're a good candidate and you're a good person and i honor you, and i honor you but i'm going to take a crack at this no one no one at all wanted to do that there's something to be said there yeah, and I, and I think I would. I mean, actually, I I would say let's just flat out discount that thing. 
yeah, there were loads of other people who would love to run for the leadership of the NDP, um, but they chose not to. And the, the, the question is, why did they choose not to? Not not because they don't want the job. I mean, I just think that's 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 just you know the PCs are going to say that that's nonsense. Um, we know that Catherine Fife was interested in it. We know that there was a guy trying to put together the money. Um, can't remember his name. Uh, as recently as earlier this week, um, there are other people: Wayne Gates, uh, Laura May Lindo. These all people whose names were kind of thrown around who were thinking about it. Um. So why why didn't they run? Um, well, I mean, certainly you already mentioned sort of what one aspect is that maybe that fifty five thousand uh, dollar price tag was too high. Um, now, you know, in in, in a previous generations, uh, finding fifty five thousand um, dollars wasn't too difficult when you could when you could take corporate donations. There would have been a union who would have stumped up that or stumped, stumped up big chunks of it. Or, or would have, you know, mm-hmm. there are ways and means when you've got corporate donations um, uh, to do that. Now you're really dependent on on the membership. Well, the unless I'm very much mistaken, the NDP's membership, whether they're in first, second place, or third place, or what place they are in in Ontario, their membership lags far, far, far behind the Ontario Liberals and, and the PCs, um, and also the, their membership certainly all the other parties lag far, far, far behind the PCs in terms of their members' spending power and and perception that spending money on politicians is uh, a worthwhile expense. I mean, I think you know uh, there's a direct correlation, as we see at the moment, between uh, donations um, that are supposed to be personal but are coming from people with corporate connections to the PCs. And, and uh, you know, it's like, a follows B, legislation follows follows a donation. You know, I mean, it's, it's almost that that clear. It's not like that with the NDP and the Liberals. And when your membership is, you know, the, the, the opposition parties in, in Ontario cannot, the vast majority of ridings, maybe not the vast majority, certainly around 50% of ridings in the whole province, uh, at least one of the two opposition parties, whether it's the Liberals or the NDP, basically will not exist in any meaningful sense. Mm -hmm. Their accounts are done by the central party. They may have two or three or four or five members. Maybe they've got 20 members, but, you know, 15 of those are pretty ancient. And, you know, uh, one of them does a a handful do do monthly donations, if you're lucky. But I mean, even that, that, that's almost a healthy riding in in today's world. Uh, If you can sort of point to 20 people who are like vaguely involved, um, now, we were talking about this before we came on. I mean, uh, maybe political parties haven't been a mass movements I- in a long time, but I think there is a general generalized decline in political involvement as people become more and more disenchanted with mainstream politics as as a means to to, an, yeah. to their ends. Uh, I, and I mean, I think of the people who are who are volunteers and activists in in. Uh, in the 905, in the areas that I'm most familiar with, um, often those people are also, you know, they may, you may know them because of their involvement in environmental politics or this or that or the other, and they'll also be involved in party politics. But I suspect that is also declining. The I, people will now be only active, act, active in one sector rather yeah, than multiple. Yeah, that, that's, that's not a new trend. That's been happening for, for gen- a generation. The current, you know, millennials are killing the political parties uh, because you're right. Like it's it's an old white man's game still for all three parties: liberal, NDP, and uh, and the progressive conservatives. The youth of today are not interested in signing up a ten dollar membership to sit around and sip coffee and and talk about seniors' tax credits and what they need. They're not interested in that. It doesn't speak to them. They don't care about it. They want to talk about climate change. They want to talk about inflation. They want to talk about how are they going to afford a, a home when they can't find a job that will pay them a fair wage or a fair salary. These are the things that matter to the youth and they don't, they're not caring. They're, they're mobilizing other ways. So that being said, like when I say they're mobilizing, you're right. They're joining 
grassroots organizations, environmental groups, uh, you know, uh, uh, labor movements, that kind of thing. So what does that mean for the modern political party? Well, it means you have to go to them. You have to open the door to them and say, okay, come on in, let's chat, let's jam, and let's figure out how I can encourage you to mark an X next to my name when it comes time to vote. The NDP kind of shot themselves in the foot on that one. That, that's, what, that's what a leadership race is about, is about throwing open the door and getting these new ideas. And people say, oh, what are you talking about over there? Are you talking about basic income? Oh, okay, that sounds interesting. What, you're talking about uh, a living wage? Oh, okay. Oh, you're talking about a, you know, some kind of climate change policy. Okay, what, tell me more about that. And it's this, it's the, you know, quote unquote, the, the marketplace of ideas. The NDP said, no, forget that. We're just going to give it to Merit Styles. And knowing the NDP, they're thinking, oh, she's going to kick all sorts of ass at, at question period. She's going to just know all the right questions to ask, and she'll hold Doug Ford to the fire at question period. And you know what I say to that? It won't matter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it just it won't matter because nobody cares about question period. You'll get a, at best, at very best, a 20-second soundbite or clip of an exchange on the evening news if people watch that. It's a, it's a waste of time, in my opinion, which means I think the NDP might have given the next election to the liberals. And this is a big what if. Uh, this is not a guarantee. And there's, I am reserve, I'm reserving the hell out of this request that I reserve <laughs> the right to be wrong on this, folks, because I very well could be. But I want you to hear me out on this. If we know, Roland and I know for a fact, there are a number of liberals who are interested in running for the leadership of that party. They want to take on the rebuilding of the liberal party of Ontario. I don't know about policies. I don't care about that right now. But the point being is you're going to have, if you have a handful of people running around this province, uh, you know, holding fundraisers in community centers, you know, talking with people, reaching out to these grassroots organizations saying, come talk to me. I want to hear, I want to do this for you. I want to, I want to pass this law, change this policy, whatever. Da, 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 da. You just, you start a dialogue happening and that's where, and that's where the millennials, the youth of today, not even youth, we're talking 20 to 30 years. That, that, that's the other thing. Just hear me on this. When I say young people, I am not talking 18 to 20. And that's what people think. I'm talking 30 to 40 year olds. These are where the millennials are today. They are working and, try, and they're trying to find a way forward in life and they're not finding it. The doors that were open to our parents' generation are shut, slammed shut and they're locked up from the other side. They Millennials know this and they're looking for a way to get ahead. If you find somebody who comes up with policies to speak to them right now, in this moment, not in a, not in three years' time, like right right now, you're going to win them over. You're going. They're going to stop and they're going to start listening to you. They're going to tell their friends and their family, "Listen to this guy. Listen to this woman. He or she has ideas that I think will help me out." And they will gravitate towards them. Three years is a lifelong lifetime in politics, and. You need to start that momentum. Once you start that momentum, you can build on it. You can keep it going. And you say, well, how do we know this will work? Because it did work. It worked in 2015. That's how Justin Trudeau won. I know people are going to say, you know, Trudeau, he's a, he, he let us down and went up. And I agree. He has not shown up to be the promise that we thought he was in 2015. But remember in 2015, the liberals were a write-off. People assumed, well, they are done. They are a third place party forever now. And the fight forever is between the conservatives and the NDP. The liberals are done. Why do we even bother? Trudeau comes in and people say, oh, he's, you know, remember, oh, he's got nice hair. Trudeau did the hard work. He went from coast to coast to coast talking with people during the leadership race. People gravitated towards him and they signed on and he held on to those people for this for the entire term of Stephen Harper. And everybody wrote him off. Everybody said, oh, he's a lightweight. He's a He's a, uh, a, a no nothing. He's, you know, why even bother? He's just, he, he's all sizzle and no, and no steak, as they say uh, out in Alberta. Turns out he's enough to defeat Stephen Harper, and he's been prime minister ever since. 
Yeah, I mean, and yeah, whatever you may think of, of Trudeau, the the Prime Minister, Trudeau, the uh, leader of the third place Liberal Party, uh, uh, played a blinder, an absolute blinder, um, and, and did. I mean, uh, turned that party around from from basically. There were many people in the Liberal Party who would not have placed a lot of money on, on the Liberals' ability to come back. Certainly not in one election. Um, you know, it, it, it's basically the kind of game that I suspect uh, Del Duca was playing in the most recent provincial election of like, well, we're not going to win it this time, but we got to look ahead to to the to the election after that, which I, I cannot understand why anybody would think that way. But anyway, um, uh, that was you know there were people who were certainly talking that way in in the Liberals back then, um, and. Uh, yeah, it's amazing what 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 a leader can what a leader can do. Um, I do want to I do want to I do want to put an asterisk on my statement. I'm not saying what is past is prologue. We could get we the liberals could have a good leadership race. They elect a, a very competent and capable leader. That person isn't predestined now to become premier of Ontario. They they will have to stick around and rebuild that party from the ground up, and that might take two election cycles. I yeah, am saying it's it very doable, and the momentum right now could be on the liberal side. If again, if the liberals don't cock it up, which yeah, they I, I, I'm not I'm not willing to go that far because I mean because Marin Stars could just play a blinder. I mean, it's certainly she. I think it's fair to say that you know from our kind of perspective as kind of some kind of media outsiders just watching things. Which NDP player caught our attention over the last year or so? Marriage Styles, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, her name would just keep coming up. It would come up in, in discussions on, on social media. So, yeah, well played. Uh, but yeah, giving up, giving up um, free publicity, you you don't do that. And and there, there are in, in terms of like major league publicity that you are going to get from all media entities. Uh, for weeks on end, repeatedly, you know, you're going to get taken all over everything you do. You're going to get interviews. You're going to get debates. You're going to get all this free stuff given to you, and you give that up uh, for an acclamation. Now, who, in whose interest is, is an acclamation? Well, I'd say only one person's, and that is Marit Styles. And it may be that she basically is like, okay, look, guys, I'm going to win. Um, uh, just let me have it, and I can, you know. I'll make sure that you're the critic for blah, blah, blah. And that's perfectly legitimate and perfectly normal. But you know what? I mean, in maybe that's the way she saw it. Maybe it isn't. Who knows? But if I was, were her, and I thought I was an absolute shoe in I would still want that leadership election um, to, to, to have gone through that process. I mean, I mean, having been inside on two leadership elections, the uh, Kathleen Wynne leadership election and, and, I say inside. I was involved with uh, a local <laughs> level, <laughs> not really inside, uh, but but you know a party member. Um, you know, I saw how the the particularly in, in a really good uh, leadership election where the winner was going to be premier of the province. You know, the the membership just skyrockets. You know, uh, increases by by most. And sure, you don't keep all those guys. A lot of those people just get, you know no, but going to vote and then they disappear. But not all of them do. And if if they're le- if the person they join to support wins, well, they're more likely to stay on. So you know, just in terms of uh, of donations and money and engagement and involvement and refreshing the membership of a, a really revitalizing mm-hmm. um, uh, revitalizing your party. Boy, it's 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 a powerful thing, um, and uh, uh, to give that up is is is. Well, uh, if if there are party high ups who are kind of angling for this um, because they think it's in their interest to just get Marit in there and on with it, uh, I think that's naive. Um, yeah. Uh, what's our final story for the night? It's a good or question. Dave, depending on when you're listening to this. <laughs> uh, well, it's a good question. What is our final story? <laughs> We were going to talk about uh, uh, the Burlington uh, purchasing oh, of Robert Bateman High. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess we could, we could yeah. Um, and actually, uh, our, our good friend at the Burlington Gazette uh, posted an article which um, 
makes a very, a very highly valid point, which is that the, uh, you know, the, the announcement came out a uh, week, two weeks ago about the actual costs um, of of buying Bateman, uh, not just buying Bateman, but the costs after buying it for um, making it habitable and usable as as a location to be used as a library, as a as a um, uh, satellite campus for um, uh, Brock University uh, and various other things, community space, et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, now you may remember some months ago there was there was you know there was the whole kind of saga with, with, um, with the councillor for Ward for Shauna Stolte getting in trouble because she was uh, alleged to have kind of uh, divulged um, uh, information that shouldn't have been divulged in, in terms of the costs of, of uh, involved with with, with Bateman. Um, the number she. Um, predicted if i remember correctly uh and she didn't release the number she just said you know we're, we're talking in the ballpark of 50 million and up uh the number that actually came in was 49.9 million um 0.1 of a million short of the number that that shauna stolte had um um said was you know the, the sort of low mark for the costs um you know, if, if you ever want to think that, that, that um, politicians aren't spiteful, <laughs> and possibly some some staff members too, um, just look at that number. That, that's a very intentional number, I would say. Um, you know, why forty nine point nine and not fifty? Oh goodness knows. Uh, but you know, we also know that that, that there's going to be a bunch of costs involved, which they're not still not talking about involved with. Um, uh, uh, asbestos uh, that was used in the every school in Ontario uh, <clears throat> of, of a certain age, and um, that that asbestos will have to be uh, removed. And uh, why are we not? Uh, are we still not getting the, the full picture of what, what's going on at Bateman? And that, that's a reasonable I, question. I still question. I, I think it comes down to the question of if the the, enti- the entire point of it is to give a place for Brock University a place to set up shop for their uh, uh, education faculty or Department of Education. Uh, my question is, why why doesn't Brock just buy it? Like, why, why does the city need to buy it so that they can lease it to Brock? Like, if Brock is so desperate for the place, why not just say, well, fine, Brock, you buy it and save the city, you know, $50 million. <laughs> I, 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 no one, no one, from the city has been able to satisfy that that answer to me of why must we the taxpayers in burlington purchase this this back like what, what it, it 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 bothers me and i know we're getting other stuff like the 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 library and oh we get to keep the pool bank okay um but here you know the other thing is building new you're, you're renovating skyway arena which is if you don't know, that's pretty much around the corner from where this place is. Um, build the pool there. And there's land there. I know for a fact, there's plenty of land. You're they're renovating it to turn it into a really nice hockey rink, which is great. Wonderful. Add on a pool. You know, um, I, I, I just, I, there's a lot of questions that nobody wants to answer from the city of Bronx on this project. Um, I still say kudos to Sean Astolte for um, at least informing us of what the, the pricing would be. And lo and behold, maybe her snafu kept the price tag at a cool 50 mil, cool, cool shy of a cool 50 mil. So, you know, kudos to you, Shauna. Well, See, that, and that's still the, the cost that they're predicting, right? Um, that that's the budget for for yeah. uh, adaptive reuse is the phrase that that using so it's not just the purchase but but the but making it you know making it good to to in fact use mm-hmm. um, you know, as for why I think because the why is because that's the way that's in other reasoning examples of school closures that's what the public very much indicated they wanted. Um, they haven't particularly indicated they wanted it with this one, but I think that the, the, the sort of knee-jerk reaction was, yeah, we have to take this back into city ownership. Um, you know, just on a side note, I think it's amazing. I mean, every every school that gets um, 
closed down and returned in whatever way is riddled with asbestos, which immediately becomes a problem when it's no longer a school. Why is it not a problem when it's still a school? Uh, I don't get that. I mean, I know I know there is asbestos in other schools in Burlington that are currently still schools. Uh, uh, you know, the teachers are just like, well, just steer clear of it and don't touch it. And uh, that seems to be okay. Uh, and there are different types of asbestos, and I appreciate that, and some are more dangerous than others. And I'm not saying that anything inappropriate is being done. Um, it's just weird that the minute a school is no longer a school, that uh, presence of asbestos in these old uh, buildings no longer is is tolerable, uh, and it's a strange, strange old business, isn't it? I mean, it's like, what the hell is that about? Uh, anyway, that's that's all. By the way, really, I mean, I, I think the city is still not being open enough about this. There's certainly no there's no reason or defence for for privacy anymore. The, the the transaction is done. This is no longer a land deal. Um, I, I don't believe that there ever was. Uh, a, a, a proper defense for the degree of secrecy there was around this. The only thing that needed to be uh, private was the actual cost of the school uh, that was going to be paid to mm-hmm. uh, to Halton uh, District School Board. Um, other than that, I don't see the need for privacy for anything, um, but, you know, this is the way that um, the government operates. Um, so we're still not hearing about uh, the full picture. Um, it is... You know, I don't think there's any real secret about the fact that there is asbestos there. It's been discussed at, at school board meetings in previous years um, when the closure was under discussion. Um, so you know, it's not a great secret other than the fact that now the city isn't isn't making that clear to the public. And, um, well, they well, should do. We shall see. All right, folks. Well, that's it for us today. Thanks very much for listening. And we will be back uh, next week. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. that's it for this episode of the 905er thank you for listening as always you can send us your feedback thoughts and concerns or ideas for future episodes to our email info at 905er.ca we'd love to hear from you you can help us keep the 905er going by financially supporting us through patreon as well as paypal Visit us at 905er.ca and click on the support tab. As well, links are in the show notes for your convenience. Lastly, you can find us on social media. Search for the underscore 905er on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So long for now. See you next time. to make the most out of this life and optimize your personal wellness then check out the natural man podcast join me host mike c as we explore all areas of human wellness physical mental and emotional learn strategies to optimize your own well-being and be in the driver's seat of your own health remember your doctor works for you learn biohacks neurohacks ways to improve sleep and ways to optimize your body and your mind. Check us out on Apple, Spotify, the Fountain app, and at naturalmanpodcast.com.